Той сега ще ви представи няколко много интересни проекта. Един от тях тази година спечели Европейската а, награда за журналистика в областта иновации. А, отново включва журналисти от много европейски страни, а, които обединяват своите усилия за да разнищат дадена тема. В случая това е миграцията и смъртта на мигранти по европейските граници. Проектът имаше и втора фаза, която съвсем скоро беше оповестена. Аз имах удоволствието да се запозная, да използвам данните на, на консорциума от журналисти, който се занимава с Migrant Files и трябва да кажа, че съм много впечатлена от работата им. Но нека да дам думата на Яко Полтавияни, който а, е така да се каже, data journalist, журналист, който работи с данни. В България темата е още съвсем нова, но вчера си говорихме, че в много европейски редакции вече има цели такива екипи. Той ще ни разкаже за своите проекти и най-вече как се организира работата по тях и какво изобщо да работиш в рамките на такъв тип журналистика. Hi, so thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm Jacopo Ottaviani, I'm from Italy, and I have been working as a, a data journalist for four years now. And uh, I was one of the first people in, in Italy to, to start this kind of journalism, and I, I know how difficult it is to, to convince editors or media outlets to, to start uh, looking at this new methodology and new practices in journalism. Uh, I want to share with you uh, a couple of projects that I have been working on in the last few uh, months and years. And most importantly, I would like to share with you the methodology that I applied and uh, used to develop these projects together with colleagues. Uh, most of the projects I'm going to introduce are cross-borders. In, part in particular, they are cross-European projects, meaning that They involved a number of European journalists. And uh, um, the first one is the Migrants Files uh, that was uh, well introduced uh, a minute ago. And this project was um, published in two chapters. The first chapter was published uh, in 2014, and it focused on the deaths of migrants uh, that tried to get to Europe. Um, both from the southern uh, frontier, meaning the Mediterranean uh, Sea, but also the eastern frontier that involves also Bulgaria, among other countries. Um, the second chapter of the Migrants Files was uh, about expenses, and it was published just two weeks ago in more than 10 media outlets in Europe. Uh, we focused, but later I will give you more details on this, We focused on the expenses of the European countries to uh, deport migrants, to uh, defend the frontiers, and to uh, check, for example, the, the borders, so border controls technologies and, and related. Uh, we also uh, compared how much the European countries spent with the amount spent by, by the migrants themselves who paid the smugglers, and the conclusion was uh, scary. Uh, what the migrants spent seems to be higher to what the European uh, Union and the countries, the member states, spent to defend uh, the, the, the border. Um, so we investigated the human costs and the economic cost of uh, migration and immigration in, uh, in, um, in Europe and to Europe. Um, but I think that uh, instead of going too much in details on the story themselves that you can find online, I will share with you all the links in the end and the slides, uh, I would like to focus on the methodology because I really think that uh, you guys could be the next ones to start using this methodology and to bring this in, in Bulgaria and start collaborating with other journalists. Uh, nowadays, a lot of topics can't be seen or observed only from a national level, but has have to be investigated uh, from a, a broader perspective, which includes uh, more countries, not only one. So, um, 
for example, yesterday we had a discussion and we started brainstorming on a possible project on Roma people. It doesn't make sense to, to uh, investigate the Roma community only in Bulgaria or only in Italy or only in Romania. It makes sense, it would make sense to, to access, uh, to investigate this topic from a European perspective. And you can apply this to all sorts of topics. Uh, I will give you a couple of examples, starting from the migrants files. Um, then I will show you another project that uh, is probably uh, more local. It's less global than the migrants files, but it's more focused on south of Europe. But I talked to some uh, Eastern European uh, journalists who told me, well, this is not only about south of Europe, this also involves our countries. And this project is uh, Generation E which is uh, a project focusing and investigating the young migrants, intra-European migrants, meaning the, the young people who, due to the uh, financial crisis in Europe or the unemployment, leave their countries and go to the north of Europe, for example. We crowdsourced and explored the data about these new flows and uh, it used a similar methodology of the migrants' files. It was, the team was composed of less people. The migrants' files was about more than 10, 10, 12 journalists and researchers. Generation E was only developed by uh, four or five people. Uh, one per country, one from Italy, one from Portugal, one from Spain, and one from Greece. And, but we produced a lot of stories that in different languages uh, try to raise awareness around this topic. Um, I'll show you how we did it uh, right after the migrants files. And then if I have some, uh, some minutes, I will show you another project that focuses on uh, the Chinese presence in Africa. So this is not European, and this is not a, cross, um, a teamwork, but I think that has an interesting interface that can be replicated in other projects. Um, don't worry about the links because I'll share with you uh, all these files I'm using now. Uh, and I would, if you agree, I would start with the migrants files. And I have a video here that gives you an idea of the project, especially of the first chapter of the project. Um, may I ask you to like switch off the lights or just uh, let's see if it works with the audio. There should be some audio, but mm, just a second. Otherwise, it's just uh, it's just music, and you can read the subtitles. Well, as I told you, the, the Migrants Files was uh, developed by more than 12 journalists and published in uh, multiple languages. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not, okay, thank you. This video is, uh, is a sort of trailer of the investigation that uh, shared the name all across Europe. So we had this hashtag migrants files that helped us to track the conversation on the social networks. And the same we did with Generation E. We had a hashtag and a name that was shared by all the, all the media involved, uh, regardless the language. So let's start with this.
okay. So as you could read, the first chapter of the migrants files, and if you go on migrantsfiles.com, you can find all the, all the results of the investigation focused on the deaths of migrants. Um, how did we came to this conclusion and why we, we, we started this investigation? We started the investigation because basically there is no data, no exhaustive data provided by the European institutions or research, research centers in, uh, in Europe. Uh, the only data available is uh, very fragmentary. It is very uh, unexhaustive and partial. Uh, the data, for example, that we found in Italy was for only focusing on the Mediterranean Sea because uh, that's where Italy has to deal with migrants uh, losing their lives. But we wanted to have a bird's eye view on, uh, on Europe and we wanted to know how many people died in over more than 15 years. All the data we found before was just a piece of the, of the mosaic. We wanted to have a complete picture of it. And uh, that's why we, we built a team of more than 12 journalists from different countries in Europe putting together the data that they could find in their country or from the sources that we selected. So it was um, an open intelligence uh, methodology applied uh, to the topic, meaning that we didn't actually investigate new data, but we took uh, existing data sets, we put them together, and we came to the conclusion that uh, more than 20,000 uh, people died uh, it's actually the, the, the 20,000 figure was the figure that we uh, firstly uh, provided, but as it is a, an ongoing project, now we arrived to 30,000 refugees and migrants that died in their attempt to reach or stay in Europe since 2000. And uh, this, uh, this figure is the main result of the first chapter of the migrants' files. It was also um, taken by the International Organization of Migration meaning that uh, they appreciated our work and recognized the, the scientific value of the, of the investigation. We also involved a statistician in the team that uh, took care of the error in the analysis. And I think it's something that uh, newsrooms or investigative journalists will have to do more and more in the future to collaborate with people from the scientific field who have a, a strong literacy uh, in statistics and uh, data analysis. Uh, we had programmers, developers in the team that developed data visualizations, and we had uh, old schools journalists that uh, pr produced the stories. We produced more than 10 stories that in different languages, and every single story reported this figure of the, the 20 or 30,000 uh, people dying. But all, all, every single story had a different angle that adapted to the local audience. So for example, in Italy with L'Espresso, we built this story here that uh, gave, gave the, the, the figure I told you but also uh, focused on, uh, on the Mediterranean Sea because uh, that's where uh, the, the Italian audience lives and uh, they are very interested in knowing what's going on uh, in Lampedusa, for example. Um, as you can see, uh, we also, together with the publication, we, we published the methodology, open, and uh, the data set so that the readers can test and stress test our, our methodology and uh, challenge us to say, uh, for example, okay, uh, this part of the data set is not complete. So we wanted to involve the readership and the other scientists, the people who uh, come across our project to uh, strengthen our data set. That's why I told you it's an ongoing project. It, it hasn't finished with the publication, but it's still going on and we are still updating the data set which is publicly available. Um, let me go back to uh, the first chapter and I'll show you that we have uh, a spreadsheet that uh, includes all the data we, we put together from different sources. So if you click here, you have uh, more than uh, 30,000 people dying, events coming from uh, 
different sources with the date, description, uh, latitude, longitude. So this is uh, geolocated on an interactive map thanks to these two columns. And uh, we have the route they used, Central Mediterranean, for example. And then we have the source where this event has been taken. And we basically based our uh, our investigation on existing news uh, records that were put all together and cross-checked. Um, but we report the links of the, of the single events so people can explore it and then fix uh, something that seems to be wrong. So we recognize that the, the data is not perfect, it's not like bulletproof, but uh, we, we recognize that this is the best estimation uh, ever provided and, uh, and that the European uh, Union or the European countries didn't know how many people died in, in 15 years. They only knew that in, perhaps in three years X people died. We wanted to give a, a great picture on this. Um, the second chapter of the migrants' files follow the same uh, philosophy. Uh, we put together the same team, we involved new people from new countries, we enlarged the, the team and we um, used the experience we had in the first chapter. And the Money Trails, which is the name of the second chapter, which is also available on the same website, uh, came to the conclusion that uh, refugees and migrants spent over one billion a year to reach Europe and uh, most of this uh, money went to the pockets of smugglers. The same smugglers that should be countered by Europe and, and, and uh, that were countered by spending uh, a very relevant amount of money, which is though inferior to minor and smaller than the, the billion that the migrants spend uh, and pay for the for the their very dangerous uh, journeys to Europe, and again we took the we took the amounts from uh, existing sources, but we put them all together. We cleaned the data sets we built, and we did it collaborate uh, in a collaborative uh, fashion all together, um, using a, a platform that is called, uh, of course, Google Drive but also uh, Trello. I'll show you later how to use this uh, project management tool that helps people to put and, and share uh, and comment the, the, the jobs they are doing and the tasks they are covering with their roles. And uh, in this case, we produced also other data visualizations that were embedded by all the media partners that we involved in different languages. So for example, this is a network visualization uh, that shows the projects uh, that were developed uh, by the European Union. Um, for example, we could see very interesting projects uh, of, uh, some of them were very weird, of uh, technologies that are used to counter migration. For example, we found some sniffers that uh, were used by the authorities to detect the smell of migrants into trucks. Uh, and we, we found uh, walls, we found fences. Uh, we, for example, calculated that more than 80 million euros were spent to build walls in Europe, which sounds very old fashioned, but uh, as you probably know, uh, also in Bulgaria, they are building now um, a wall to, pr uh, to um, push back the Syrian refugees. And it's on the border with, uh, with Turkey, if I'm, if I'm right. Uh, the same happened in Spain, and the same happened in Greece. So, and now there is also the possibility that Hungary will build a new wall. So we are having a lot of walls in, in Europe, but nobody talks about the, the, the amount spent to build them. We tried to put all the figures together and we arrived to the final figure, which is uh, 13 billion since 2000. Uh, 16 billion euros since 2000 spent by uh, by the um, European countries and the European Union to counter migration and to deport illegal migrants, so-called illegal migrants. We broke down the expenses and put together everything into this tree map. This is called the tree map. 
and you can click on it and see uh, the actual amounts and the description. Um, you can see that the biggest slice uh, was spent to deport people, meaning that to fly them back to their countries, to escort them to the airport, and uh, related expenses. So uh, this is how much Europe spends uh, to uh, take people back to their countries. Um, again, uh, the interesting thing is that we produced the visualizations, the data sets, all together, and then we translated them and, and co-published on different media outlets on the same day. We published it in the uh, World Refugees Day, uh, which was like uh, 10 days ago, more or less. Um, some media outlets published it uh, slightly earlier, others published it one day after, but uh, we did this to maximize the impact. Uh, we could see a lot of reactions from the users who shared our, our uh, stories on their social media. And uh, um, it changes from country to country. For example, in Italy, uh, this topic is really hot. It's uh, every day on the headlines because we are very exposed and we receive migrants every day from the Mediterranean Sea. But uh, for example, uh, in other countries, uh, this was fairly new and uh, helped a lot to raise awareness around uh, this topic. Okay, uh, again, this is another visualization that was co-published by, by all the media outlets. Uh, it's an interactive map that shows how many people died uh, on the different spots. And uh, you can zoom in and see, for example, in Bulgaria. You can do that later. But yeah, the bloodiest routes are the one uh, in, in, like in the south of Sicily, in Italy, on Lampedusa. Um, and then you have the eastern route from Turkey, Greece. And then you have also in Spain a hot spot here. And uh, I invite you to, to have a look at the methodology uh, because I think it can be reused by your projects. So um, I'll, I'll leave the, the final part of the presentation for questions. So if you have any question about the migrants files, we can go back later. I would like to go quickly to the next one, which is Generation E. And I have told you that we uh, as a team of uh, four data journalists started uh, investigating on how the South European young migrants are doing in the north of Europe. And uh, we had the idea of crowdsourcing this. We wanted to hear their voice directly without, um, without uh, having in intermediate, intermediate steps. We wanted to have a direct connection with them. And to do so, we uh, set up uh, a crowdsourcing campaign that was uh, that tried to target this community of people, and uh, we created this uh, crowdsourcing form, as you can see, from which we asked uh, qualitative and quantitative information to the migrants. We focused on people who are uh, from 20 year old to 40 year old although it was open to also older people. But we wanted to know about the young ones, and so we explicitly asked to the young people to, to respond, and we received more than 2,000 stories, uh, which is uh, a fair amount to, to start drawing conclusions, even though we know, again, that this is not like bulletproof, it's not, uh, it, it, it has to be some bias because all the people are um, contacting us spontaneously and from the internet. But uh, nothing similar existed uh, before and we released uh, some interesting uh, insights about young people living abroad. And we wanted to take a picture of this new generation that we labeled E which stands for Europe, or also Erasmus, but also emigration or uh, exodus. So it has like 
different sides. It's not only negative or positive. We wanted to start without prejudices and investigate how they are doing. And um, you can see that we included some structured um, uh, answers here so that we could take uh, an easy conclusion. We could draw an easy conclusion. But we also left um, a free text field where people can, could write their stories. And uh, it was a, um, a thrilling experience to receive more than 2,000 stories directly from our readers in different languages. And some of them uh, felt like, oh, this is the first time I can tell my story to someone. And they sent us very, very long and detailed stories. We selected the best stories and then interviewed them in, on an individual basis. But we also wanted to give some quantitative um, conclusions. So you can see we generated some, uh, um, some charts that show the differences between uh, the four countries we, we, we took the data from. We, for example, sh uh, one of the most important conclusions is that Europe, Eurostat, for example, but even the the National uh, Institutes of Statistics don't know how many migrants leave their countries and go to, to Germany, to Scandinavia. Because now with, with uh, the freedom of movement, without the need of a visa, we can go easily from one place to another and nobody is taking a record of our uh, movement. So the, the thing is that uh, the National Institutes of Statistics count as many young migrants as those that go spontaneously to the office and say, hey, I'm changing my residence now. I'm not more living in, uh, in Spain, but I'm living in uh, uh, Germany. I'm living in Poland. And uh, those are just half of those that actually live abroad. Because mm, if you register as a migrant, uh, you lose a lot of rights in your country and you're also symbolically leaving your country kind of forever and not, not all the migrants want to do it. So we show that more than half of them are not registered, meaning that the statistics provided by uh, the National Institutes of Statistics are partial. Then we also ask them if they want to go back to their countries and uh, we show that most of them want to go back to their countries, but they are not sure. They answered, I hope so, while the second op most common option was no. And then we also investigated the driving factors of, uh, that um, generated the migration. And we showed that uh, working-related issues are uh, a very important factor, but it's not the only one. Most of the people um, selected more than one option. Some of them are just ambitious and they want to expand their uh, horizons. Others went out abroad because they fell in love with someone. Others because they want to have a master's degree. So it's not only about unemployment. We, did it, we wanted to uh, show the complexity of the, of the young youth migration in Europe. And the results, again, is like a huge list of publications. Once you get the data together, then it's easy to translate stories to publish in different outlets all across Europe. You create a sort of coalition of media and you, you go to the media outlets and say, hey, I'm working together with uh, five other uh, journalists from uh, Italy, Greece, Germany, England. Uh, would you like to be the media partner of this coalition? And they usually take this quite seriously because, I mean, it's also a prestige for the media outlets to be part of this. So if you are freelancers, I invite you, I recommend you to go to them and if you have ideas, create your team and then uh, join forces with other journalists across Europe. I have some slides about Generation E that I've already told you. I just want to show you uh, the methodological part which can be reapplied um, these are the findings, these are the stories. Just one question, for how long did you uh, receive more than 2,000 stories? 
it was uh, four months and we published twice. Basically, we launched on uh, f four media outlets in four languages in the same day in September of last year. And that was the moment that we received most of the stories because, you know, it, it's the moment of visibility of the project. And that's why we wanted to make a co-publication because we could say to the people, hey, uh, there are Spanish, Greeks, Portuguese, or Italians that are responding, why don't you do it? Take part of the community. And it was successful. Uh, like in the first week, we had uh, uh, 1,200 stories. And then in the second uh, part of the project, from the first co-publication to the second co-publication, including the second publication part, which left the crowdsourcing form open, we doubled and we got to 2,400 stories that were aggregated into the visualizations I told you and were published on uh, several media outlets. Uh, you can find all the publications online. So um, what are the limits and the potentials of this methodology? Uh, I told you the sample is not representative uh, of the population. So keep in mind that if you crowdsource uh, stories, you are targeting a specific community of people, a specific subset of the population. Uh, so uh, you know this from the beginning, and when you write your stories, you publish your stories, you state it in the end when you also share the methodology. Uh, however, even though it's biased, if you know the bias, then you can correct them using statistical methods. Um, and make it more rigorous. Once you have 2,400 stories, you, you actually can really write a book about this. You can find the most interesting stories into an Excel file. Uh, you can see, for example, what we made was a focus on, uh, uh, let me open it. It's uh, on here. We wanted to, you know that now Germany is attracting a lot of migrants from the south of Europe, so we wanted to focus on the uh, southern European migrants living in Germany, and we, okay, gave an, in, an overview with Corrective uh, that partnered with us as a German partner and then published on, uh, on uh, TATS uh, in Germany, in German. Uh, this shows you that these topics can be unpacked and unrolled both in the uh, or countries of origins of the migrants but also in the countries of destinations such as Germany and we went qualitative in this case we selected eight interesting uh, according to us stories uh, two per country so for example we have uh, an Italian singer opera singer living in, uh, in Mannheim in Germany we called her, we interviewed her, uh, and this was ta her contact was taken directly from the crowdsourcing campaign. And then we published this profile. Uh, she explains us how she feels as a migrant, etc., etc. But I, I suppose that you see this as a methodology that can be applied again to Bulgarian uh, migrants living in Europe or, or to other kind of uh, to other categories of people. Uh, so you see this uh, relationship between quantitative and qualitative approach. We combined it as uh, the best we could. And uh, so yes, I told you, I mentioned you a tool before, which is called uh, Trello. Uh, it's a dashboard. If you go to Trello.com, you can you have this kind of um, interface. This is my my account and I quickly show you how it looks like. So this is the Migrants Files uh, dashboard where people can um, share links, uh, reports, minutes of the calls, for example. We regularly had a Skype meeting across different time zones. Uh, there were people in, uh, in Spain, there were people in, uh, in Greece with two hours of uh, uh, difference and uh, we shared all the information here where people can comment, as you see, and share the developments of the project 
you can upload files, you can receive notifications, you can uh, set up uh, timelines. So it's a tool, I, uh, it's a free tool that I suggest you to have a look at because it uh, helps a lot the project management. Uh, the same tool was used for Generation E, as you see. You can click on uh, cards and then comment and uh, exchange information. You receive uh, here the notifications. You can tag your colleagues. It's a handy tool that I suggest you to have a look at. Um, yes, so I told you that I wanted to show you a last project, which is uh, not a cross-borders project, but has an interesting interface. It's a data journalism project uh, developed for Al Jazeera, uh, and it investigates the aid spent by China, the Chinese aid spent in, uh, in Africa to build uh, infrastructures, for example. We found, uh, you know that this is a very hot topic in Africa right now. The, the African countries feel like the Chinese are going there and uh, building up uh, bridges, but also houses, but also uh, mines, industries, and research centers, uh, and whatsoever. And they feel like this is a new colonization. We wanted to see substantially what it is, at least according to the existing data. And again, we approached the topic from a qualitative and a quantitative uh, perspective. Uh, qualitative is, uh, takes place with this tour, as you see. This, in this interface starts with a tour. Uh, people can uh, ex start the tour. And then you, you actually uh, see a selection of eight uh, Chinese projects in, uh, in Africa. I, I tried to cover all categories that appeared on this data set. And then you can click around and see the, the categories of the infrastructures. And it's not only about industries, but it's also uh, structures that um, try to uh, create a soft power, such as like institutes of culture, or uh, internet uh, backbones. And this also implies all the surveillance problem in Africa, because if China builds the, the broadband backbone in Tanzania, they have access to the cables where, uh, where the data flows. And they can, if they want, they can install a backdoor, for example. So uh, we try to, to give a face to, to the Chinese presence in Africa. And we wanted to show that they are building uh, uh, Confu Confucius uh, Institutes. And uh, this shows that they want to spread the, the Chinese culture. It's not only about money. It's also about culture and soft power. So we, mapped, we found out that 45 uh, centers are being built right now in, in Africa in different countries. We show that they are investing in universities, research centers. But what I want to show you that is that when you finish the, the tour and you see all sorts of categories, then you, you have an overview. And you see the quantified amounts spent in every country by China. And uh, it's broken down by category. For example, if you, if you click here on Ethiopia, you see that they, are, they have spent uh, 8 billion US dollars. And uh, for example, 12 billions on, on uh, educational and culture, and you can break down everything here. If you so this is another interface that uh, was developed with D3.js, uh, an interesting uh, library to create this kind of visualizations, and uh, involved uh, me as a journalist, and also designed the, the interface. And then we, I had a developer with me from Journalist Plus uh, Plus, which is an agency in Europe that runs uh, journal, data journalism projects. Well, uh, I think I would leave the next uh, few minutes for um, questions, if you have any. And uh, feel free to contact me uh, on Twitter, on, um, via email whenever you want. If you want to talk about cross-European data journalism, I'm available and I'll be happy to hear from you. 
so, so I would dedicate the next 10 minutes to questions, and then if we have extra minutes, I'll show you an extra project. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you if, uh, for example, the migrant files, because it exposes the most like um, uh, dramatic data, did it uh, have any political reactions? Um, so, um, in particular, in the, the first uh, chapter, because we, we tried to hit and to target the stakeholders, including the, the polit politicians. Uh, in the first chapter, we started bombarding uh, the European uh, uh, Parliament people, but most of them ignored us, except some others uh, that tweeted us back that the data existed. But we show, we, we show them that we, we did a freedom of, uh, of information request and they told us that this data didn't exist. So we could answer and reply them back. Uh, I believe that in the second chapter, the timing is good because now it seems that uh, migration is being taken by uh, Europe more seriously and more from a European perspective. And um, you know they are now discussing how to distribute the refugees across Europe. So uh, it seems that we, we are pushing towards that direction and we are Europeanizing the, the debate on this. But so far, um, not really any, any specific reaction. Uh, my name is Salima. I have a totally different question. Did you also thought about perhaps um, announcing what governments say it costs a year when uh, immigrants uh, are present in their, in their country? Like for instance, in the Netherlands, I know they say it costs 20,000 uh, uh, euro each year for each immigrant while he or she is in procedure. So uh, we focused on uh, very specific research questions. Basically, uh, we, all these projects start with a list of research questions that are very narrow and very, very specific. We don't want to uh, answer everything. We don't have the, the resources to do that, and we want to uh, focus on very, something very specific. So uh, in the, the money trails, in the second chapter, we um, uh, drew this research question. How much Europe spends for deportations and how much Europe spends to uh, control the borders, to push them back, to travel them back? So we didn't actually calculate how much they cost when they are, for example, in, uh, uh, in the centers. There is no housing. There is no um, um, calculation about how much they cost uh, every day in, uh, in, the specific, in, the, in the various countries. This could be another research question that can be run. But I think this exists uh, somehow. They calculated that. Uh, that's why we didn't do that. So we, we focused on these other uh, sides of it. Uh, hi there. Hi. My, uh, my name is Martin. Uh, we, uh, my question is more to do with the way that you uh, manage to actually collect this uh, type of people that you need for data journalism and afford to run such uh, investigations which require a lot of effort, a lot of uh, time and uh, specific skills because we see it in our newspaper, the newspaper that we're working for, that we don't have enough time or uh, money and uh, you know, uh, special skills in, some time, uh, some, uh, in certain occasions to manage to collect all these data before we, we run into the, actually in the, into the stories. So can you elaborate a bit on that? Thank you. Yes. Um, so this is actually uh, the power of this kind of methodology. We are sharing the costs of, for example, having a statistician on board. Uh, these projects were funded by journalismfund.eu. Uh, both Migrants Files and Generation E, uh, we collected a very small grant uh, from Journalism Fund, which I suggest you to explore. It's this website. Uh, they provide cross-borders uh, uh, journalism uh, grants that are usually um, not so big, but help to, to start projects. 
And then um, when you share the knowledge among uh, different uh, journalists, you can join forces and divide the costs. So it's, it's easier to make a project like this when you are 12 people and you have a grant instead of doing it uh, uh, internally in your newspaper. So basically the two key factors are uh, creating an, an international team and then finding a small or, or, I mean, the bigger the better, but at least a small grant that helps you to start the project. If you don't have uh, an NGO behind you, for example, giving you funds, I mean, I'm talking as a freelancer or a journalist. Uh, next. Hello. Hi. Here. Ah, hey. <laughs> My name is Tina, and I was wondering for uh, the first time when you launched um, Generation E, yes. what media outlets did you use to outsource your project and to gather information uh, from your target audience in such short period of time? Thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. Um, so if you go to generatione.eu, you have uh, the list of publications. Uh, we, we, we were initially covered by uh, four media outlets that were our media partners. Uh, but our strategy, and these media outlets are from Spain, Italy, um, Greece, and Portugal. Uh, I, can, I can tell you the names, but they are, uh, except in, in, the, in the Greek case, which was a radio called the Radio Bubble, the one I opened here. Um, we had uh, online newspapers. Uh, in Portugal, we, we had uh, Publico, which is the most famous uh, uh, newspaper and in, in Portugal. In Italy, we had Il Fatto Quotidiano, but all the others are, uh, are uh, online newspapers. And uh, they were aware that the others were publishing that day. So this is actually a way to, to convince them that this project has to be published that day and it doesn't have to be delayed for weeks. Um, but right after the publication, since we managed to create some um, hype, to create some noise in the social networks uh, across our networks of uh, friends and contacts, other media outlets came to us and uh, we were covered by The Guardian, we were covered by Vice, we were covered by, um, I don't know, for example, uh, Collective, as I told you before. Uh, and we, we were actually also covered by these uh, three online publications, uh, the Columbia Journalism Review and Neiman Lab and the European Journalism Observatory that came to us and asked about our methodology. So this is a sort of meta-publication, so a publication about the publication. And here we share uh, our findings, but also our methodology. So I invite you to have a look at generatione.eu and uh, I can give you a, a very short anticip anticipation about the next steps of Generation E. Uh, project, we are thinking of going uh, on, on the ground, meeting the, the migrants, film them, see how they live, and go multimedia. Because I, we, I believe, uh, but we all believe, that one of the limits of Generation E so far is that it's only written. You can't see, except some pictures, you can't see really how these people live. So we want to go on the ground, and this is, I think it's interesting to see how data can be connected to uh, everyday life to reality. I mean, data journalism doesn't have to be seen as something uh, isolated, something uh, closed into a chamber. It's something that has to be seen as a tool to access reality, to, to go on the ground and meet the people are uh, recorded in the statistics or aggregated in the statistics. This is actually, um, this actually leads the, the conversation towards an existential and uh, level we journalists want to see reality. We probably all started this job because we want to explore what's going on in the world. We don't want to close ourselves or lock ourselves, ourselves up into an Excel file or into this, the website of the Institutes of Statistics. We want to see people and meet people. So le remember that behind data, there are people, stories. Some of them are uh, amazing, such as the, the opera singer that we found from the crowdsourcing. Yeah. Uh, 
next or any more questions Maybe it would be interesting also if some of the Bulgarian journalists join <laughs> this yes. project because there is uh, there are numerous young people from Bulgaria who never who go study abroad and yes. never come back to the country. So yes, uh, please. Are come you to open? Me are you open for uh, yes. other countries? Uh, we actually uh, among the options there was the possibility to extend uh, the generation E in Eastern Europe, so covering also the Balkans. Because so many, so many people came to us saying, hey, this is not only about Spain, Greece, uh, Italy, and Portugal. It's also about Bulgaria, Romania, and others. So feel free to come to me and uh, about this or other things later. Uh, may I ask you how many minutes I have left? Or because in case I have some... uh, Around two or three minutes. Ah, OK. Well, uh, I, I can't spend so much more time. Um, there is a, um, a long discussion on how to finance these projects. Maybe this is interesting for you. So I, I mentioned the journalism fund, but uh, there are topics that are funded by other foundations and uh, um, organizations. I, Open Society came to my mind when before we had a question from the audience. Uh, Open Society funds journalistic projects. So it's always a good idea to uh, combine different uh, sources of uh, funding to, to create solid projects. It's quite complicated from my point of view to create something like uh, the migrants' files, but also the, the, the investigations that were presented before with only the money coming from newspapers. At the moment, uh, that's difficult. It's always good to have uh, some organization helping. So, the hunting for grants is part of this methodology, I would say, at the moment at least. And, okay, I have a question to you too. I don't see Paul in the room, otherwise I would ask him as well. Ah, I might have a pros. Da. Okay. Uh, вие и колегите ви споделяте повече опита си за работа с европейски държави и щатите, но в последното време се наблюдава uh, пране на пари чрез Китай, чрез китайски бизнесмени. Uh, парите се завъртат и след това идва тук uh, като китайски инвестиции. Бихте ли споделили ваши опити и някаква идея, защото с Китай е много трудно да се работи? Thanks for the question. Um, I know that it's very difficult to, to work with, uh, with China and to uh, investigate what China is doing around the world. Uh, especially, uh, it, it's difficult in Africa, uh, where the data was provided by uh, an American uh, NGO that is focusing uh, on, on uh, Chinese presence in Africa. So the data is not released by China itself, but it's uh, somehow collected by a Washington-based uh, NGO. Uh, so in, in particular about the Chinese presence in Europe, I have no experience, but uh, I can confirm that uh, it's very difficult. It's, I would say, impossible to get data from, from China itself. So I would suggest you to look for uh, uh, studies, like academic studies, uh, focusing on uh, on the Chinese in, uh, investors in uh, in Europe, yeah. А може би също и по който до сега говореше за различни бази данни в различни страни, може да го питате лично по този въпрос, защото ми се стори, че той има опит с събиране на данни от всякакви страни по целия свят. Можете да разговаряте с него в обедната почивка, която предстои. Само един въпрос um, към... Uh, a question to, uh, to both of you. It seems that with uh, all these projects, uh, they're kind of more funded by foundations. And uh, basically, they are based on the enthusiasm of journalists to search, to look, and to find some uh, finance. 
But uh, do you think that there is a place in the newsrooms? Uh, the, the, yesterday we discussed that, that in, in some countries in Europe already there are data teams in the newsrooms. But um, uh, how do you think the media takes this uh, decision to invest it in such projects? And what is the actual benefit for them in order to take this decision? So yes, uh, good idea to recall. Ah, ah it's okay. okay. It's a good idea to recall uh, the conversation we had yesterday. Uh, I, I was thinking on how uh, the case of Spain is, I think, uh, interesting in this moment, because Spain hasn't started, like the UK, doing data journalism internally uh, five or six years ago, but they are starting right now. And uh, what it is interesting to see in Spain is that uh, it all started when one, uh, one newspaper, El Confidencial, created the first data unit, internal data unit uh, of only three people, uh, two data journalists and uh, one programmer. And uh, when the other competitors, when the other newspapers uh, noticed that El Confidencial had a data unit, a sort of chain effect started. And uh, the others also started uh, hiring data journalists. This probably happened also because in Spain, there is a, an interesting reality in Madrid. Uh, there is a master's degree in uh, data journalism and uh, investigative journalism, which takes place at El Mundo's uh, newspapers building. So they have uh, one of the major uh, media outlets is running, is hosting um, a master's degree uh, from which every year more than um, between 10 and 15 data journalists came, come out of the, of the masters and they are sent as interns to existing media outlets. So somehow the media outlets see the power of data journalism and they see it almost for free because they get an intern that doesn't cost a lot. They get used to it, so for six months they see that visualizing data works well, uh, they get in interesting traffic from the data blogs they run or the data articles they do. The other journalists like to work together with the data journalists because many articles mention statistics and they want to have a very quick visualization about uh, anything. So this is a virtuous circle that is taking place in Spain and I suppose that will start in the other countries soon or not so soon, but in a couple of years. I mean, I think that the media outlets can re can't stop time. They can't stop the technology. So at some point, uh, uh, everywhere, they will accept this. It will take some time. But I, I think that if you start doing it, you, you are somehow penetrating the establishment, and uh, it, you uh, make it faster. You know, every year in the spring, there is a conference in Brussels. It's called Data Harvest. It has been taking place for four or five years now. And I remember the first time when I joined five years ago, it started with the introduction. Everybody says, hi, I'm, I'm Christophe, journalist from Belgium. Hi, I'm Maria, journalist from, from Bulgaria. And, and there were like 100 people, and there were one or two guys who said, hi, I'm a data specialist. All the others were looking. This year, at the conference, there were, I think, maybe 15 or 20 people raising their hands saying, hi, I'm a data journalist. So it, it is already happening. Um, this fact means that there must be return on investment. Media owners, companies see that it's worth to invest in people with data skills because they will contribute to better stories. I mean, the migrant files, they won a, a great prize. Um, many journalistic data investigations of the last years have been rewarded because it was a good job. It also brings more clicks, more newspapers sold. So there is return on investment. Um, look at other sectors. What is it that banks are investing huge amounts of money in? It's analys analysis of big data. You know, everybody is doing it. So we as a media should not lag behind. On the contrary, we should take the opportunity. Um, there is more and more open data available, more and more governments are becoming aware of the necessity to, to publish data. So it would be a missed opportunity if um, media also in Bulgaria do not invest 
and colleagues in the newsroom who know something about data. When I look around here in the room, I also see a lot of young people. I mean, rather people in their 30s, 20s, 30s, than in their 50s or 60s. This is not a coincidence. It is because our generation grew up with IT. Um, somehow it seems to be easier to, to set up a Twitter account and, 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 and explore an Excel file for people who grew up with the IT, who have it in their fingers. So I also think it's a huge opportunity for, for young journalists and data specialists uh, um, to, to launch their career. So I, I see it as a win-win. And I think it's also important that generations do not conflict about this. No, here, generations should go hand in hand. I mean, the, the senior journalists, the one who are like, for instance, 50 plus, if they share all, all their experience in, in, uh, in terms of good investigations, old school reporting, uh, and this combined with the data skills of the young generation, I, I think you can, you can make a very good uh, project. So, um, so no question, yes, it is a good investment. Two, it is already happening. And three, there are so many opportunities. So I, I, I think this is an evolution that has started, that cannot be stopped. And, and if you are a journalist specialized in data, if you are a data specialist specialized in writing, so combine the skills. Don't leave the writing for the journalist and the data only, only for, for the data nerds, so to speak. So make sure that you learn also new competences. I, I'm jealous about him. I'm jealous about what he can do in terms of exploring data. Um, so uh, for me, I also want to learn, learn, learn new, new tricks in terms of, of analyzing data. Yeah, I agree that hybrid approach is the best. Hybrid, hybrid backgrounds are the best. So uh, get contaminated by the others in the newsroom and contaminate the others with your skills. Share and, and take the best out of everyone. Of course, there are people who are more keen in, on learning. Others are less keen, but you, you are able to, to join forces with the people you, you think are uh, enthusiastic. Okay. Thank you very much. I think Thanks. this was a Thank great you. conclusion to the first part. Имате вече техните контакти. Препоръчвам ви наистина да бъдете във връзка с тях, защото те изключително много реагират, има какво да споделят и да, да, дори да правите интересни неща заедно.